If you've got a Bible, would you grab it and turn to Genesis chapter 2? Today we're going to continue looking at what it means to be human and the story of creation as uh, as the story of creation kind of zooms in from this cosmic view of God making everything um, down to a personal view um, that gets up close and personal on the ground. Now, um, some people, um, what they will do is they they will try to play Genesis chapter 2 against Genesis chapter uh, 1 because they'll point out things like, hey, in Genesis 1, the plants of the field are created before the man, but in Genesis chapter 2, the man is created before the plants of the field. And so you could look at that and say, how inconsistent is the Bible? Like page 1 can't even agree with page 2. What's going on in this story? You could do that, but you'd be quite rude to do so. Uh, And and what I mean is you'd be kind of like the American that travels overseas to a foreign country and is like, why doesn't anyone speak English here? Um, You could do that, um, but I don't want you to be that guy. You don't want to be that guy. And I speak from experience. You don't want to be that guy because if you can get outside of your world, there is more to experience, more to know, but you're only going to do that if you can lay down your preconceived notions and hear um, what's actually available to you in that place. And um, I've said this a few times throughout this series because uh, it's really a burden of mine that as we preach Genesis, Uh, I am aware that perhaps more than no other book of the Bible, some people have rejected Jesus and the gospel based on um, some preconceived notion of Genesis that's not actually what Genesis is saying. So whether that is Genesis is unscientific or Genesis can't agree with itself, what we're trying to do in this series, I'm not trying to offend you by calling you rude, uh, I'm trying to invite you to see this text in a fresh way. Um, Because if we can come to this and recognize what we saw a couple of weeks ago, that this is an ancient text, it's not concerned uh, with giving a scientific detailed account of creation like we as moderns might be. Those are good questions, but we should probably address those to a proper place, not ask or expect an ancient book that the Holy Spirit has inspired to speak to every age on our very modern topics. And so my invitation to you this morning has been the same. It's been throughout this series. You're going to keep hearing this. It's to lay down our preconceived notions about what the text is trying to do and allow the text to speak on its own terms. And I think if you can do that, the beauty of this story is going to surprise you in some incredible ways. Um, And so in order to do that, let me just set up our whole text today this way. Um, In the first verse we're going to read, we're going to read that the story of the heavens and the earth, which is what that bumper video was going to be about. God created the heavens and the earth. We've been there for a few weeks now. We're going to see in our first verse that order gets uh, reversed, that we're now going to talk about the earth and the heavens. So um, I know I've been talking to some of you and you're like, do I have to go to seminary to be able to read the Bible? Like, absolutely not. Um, You don't need to know ancient cultures. You don't need to know ancient Hebrew. You... I think what we need to do is just slow down and read what's in our text with the very faithful English translation we have here to notice the narrative shifts from the story of the heavens and the earth in Genesis chapter 1 to now zooming in on the story of the earth and the heavens. Um, If you prefer kind of a film analogy, it's like Moses is going from his wide angle shot, kind of showing the cosmic view of God being the creator and king of everything, to now in Genesis 2, he busts out his narrow kind of zoomed in lens. And if you're in photography, you're like, that's not the term for it. I'm sorry. Um, But that tight shot that gives you details, you go from looking at um, humanity as a whole to uh, meeting people personally. We're going to meet our first parents uh, in Genesis chapter 2. We're going to meet Adam, the first man this week, and Eve, the first woman next week. Um, And if you don't like that order, if you're like, well, why does the man always have to come before the woman? Well, I would just ask you, um, in any creative work you've ever done, whether that's writing something, baking something, making something with your hands, is your first creation typically your best one? Yeah. Yeah. That took some of you a minute, and notice it's just the ladies that are laughing right now. So let that be a preview of next week. Next week, we're going to get into the distinctions between men and women and all the beauty that's there. I think there's some really surprising and amazing things when we get there. But before we get there, we're going to look one more time at what does it mean to be human in general. 
And how can we live as image bearers in God's good world? We talked about that last week, but we're going from the wide angle to now zooming in and getting again up close and personal detailed account of this. Are you ready? All right. Genesis chapter 2. We will pick it up in verse 4. It says this. These are the generations of the heavens and the earth when they were created, in the day that the Lord God made the earth and the heavens. When no bush of the field was yet in the land, and no small plant of the field had yet sprung up, for the Lord God had not caused it to rain on the land, and there was no man to work the ground, and a mist was going up from the land and watering the whole face of the ground. Then the Lord God formed the man of the dust from the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and the man became a living creature. And the Lord God planted a garden in Eden in the east, and there he put the man whom he had formed. And out of the ground the Lord God made to spring up every tree that is pleasant to the sight and good for food. The tree of life was in the midst of the garden, and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil." A river flowed out of Eden to water the garden, and there it divided and became four rivers. The name of the first is the Pishon. It is the one that flowed around the whole land of Havilah, where there is gold. And the gold of that land is good. Bedlam and oxen, um, onyx, excuse me, stone are there. The name of the second river is the Gihon. It is the one that flowed around the whole land of Cush. The name of the third river is Tigris, which flows east of Assyria. And the fourth river is the Euphrates. The Lord God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to work it and keep it. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, You may surely eat of every tree of the garden, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat, for in the day that you eat of it you shall surely die. And so this is what we get at the start of Genesis 2. We'll get the rest of the chapter next week, but as the story of creation zooms in, it sounds a lot like Genesis chapter 1, right? Um, You have God creating a place where everything flourishes. Um, but, But instead of looking from the heavens down on the earth, it's on the earth now looking up. And so we get details. We learn that there's a river there that splits into four rivers. And um, by the way, Bible reading 101, you just say names confidently and push through and people will just go with it. So I should have just pushed through on that one. Um, But you get all of these rivers, all of these details. And, 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 you know, some people will try to like put some of those on a map because we know where some are. We don't know where others are. But I think the big idea is that there's rivers there. Because in the ancient world, they built civilizations around water because they didn't have aqueducts yet and ways to carry water. Um, And so this is why Egypt was a powerhouse in the ancient world. They had the Nile flowing through. And so uh, an ancient reader at this time would read this and go, there's rivers there? Oh, that is a good place to be. That is a life-giving place because without water, we can't have life. Um, so, so Moses gives us this picture of everything flourishing. There's uh, water there. There was gold there. Did you notice uh, what it said? It said the gold of that land is good as opposed to bad gold. I don't, I don't know. Uh, some of you maybe could explain that one to me. Like maybe it's mixed with other stuff. I don't know. I studied Bible, not expensive stones but, or metals. Um, but we'll keep going on that one. So you've got water. You've got this precious, precious uh, commodity in gold there. And then uh, the, he continues on. He says also that there is a garden. Now, now some of you, um, you're really moved by gold and gifts like that. Others of you, you don't, you don't care about expensive gifts like that. You just want flowers. Here in a garden, we get the picture of life flourishing. Again, um, Moses is just saying this from as many angles as possible to kind of catch us up on the idea of God made the world in the language of Genesis 1 very good. In the language of Genesis 2, he doesn't just give us a broad tov, which is the Hebrew word for good, or tov, tov, very good. He zooms in and now gives us details. Very good looks like water's everywhere, and there's gold. And now it's not like the gold your neighbor's got that's like kind of a ripoff and mixed with other stuff. This is, this is the good stuff. 
and there is a garden there, and it's full of trees, and it's got all of these uh, plants that you can eat. Some of you, like that is heaven to you, like there's kale everywhere. And then he even gives us a name for this place. He calls it Eden, um, which is a word that means um, pleasure or delight. So um, if you're not the kale-eating type, if you don't really appreciate gifts like gold, he's trying to get a catch-all with this name here to go, um, hey, there's river, there's all these wonderful things there, and oh, by the way, the name of the place, God called it pleasure and delight. Would you like to be there? The, The picture he's painting is this is the place that we all want to be. Regardless of personality type, this is where life is flourishing, and this is what God makes when he makes the world. And at the center of this garden, uh, we read that there are two trees. There's the tree of life. Actually, I guess I would say there's a lot of trees in the garden. But at the center of the garden, we get the names of two trees. The tree of life and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And and I'll just tell you, hang on to that because we're going to come back to that. That's really kind of the center of what I believe these verses that we're looking at today are about. Um, But in this wonderful paradise garden, um, God makes a place that you want to be. And just like Genesis, the emphasis in this story, um, it's on the creation of humanity. So into this paradise garden, God places humanity. We're going to meet the first man this week. Like I said, we'll meet the first woman next week. Um, And uh, like I said earlier, this is going from the zoomed out shot to the close-up shot. So what I want to do is invite you to look with me now at a close-up shot of what we saw last week. Um, To look at a close-up shot of uh, the creation of humanity that is kind of at the culmination of all of these wonderful and good things. Um, the the first thing we see is in verse 7, it says, the Lord God made the man from the dust of the ground. Now, some of you right now, you're like, I like Genesis 1 better. That sounds dirty. I don't like that being my origin story. I'm not even sure I can be a Christian anymore if God likes the dirt. Um, Again, let's just hear it through an ancient lens. What this is, actually, you're not far off if you kind of react to that and go, ugh. Here's the point. Um, God makes humanity from the dust of the ground. We come out of the dirt just like the animals will later in this chapter. Um, and, and, and I point that out because the opening pages of the Bible, they are holding this tension. On the one hand, um, the opening pages of the Bible say that you and I and all humans are made in the image of God. So our life um, is of infinite value and worth because of the one that we were put here to represent and to show the world what he is like. So you are made in the image of God. You are special. You are loved. And at the same time, God can't have you thinking too much of yourself. Um, That was Satan's problem, pride. Pride isn't thinking too much of yourself. It's uh, thinking, um, excuse me, (laughs) pride is thinking, uh, it's an overinflated view of yourself. That's how I would say it. And so Satan, who was a created being, who was created mighty and good by God, uh, begins to think too much of himself. And so uh, that pride leads him and it twists him and it distorts him into an ugly, ugly enemy that we read about in the Bible. And God doesn't want that to happen to you and me. And so he puts on page one, hey, I love you. You're my images. You are more valuable than anything in the created order. But don't forget, you're not the point. That's how we said at week one. Um, You are not the creator. You are not the center of anything because if you begin to believe that, it will twist your life out of shape. It will twist you out of the image you were made in and it will distort you in such a way that people dress up like you for Halloween. So, um, So the Bible's walking this tension. You're made in the image of God. You are special. You're valuable, but you're not God. You are not the center of the universe. And so Genesis chapter 2 comes along and is like, yeah, God loves you, but he made you from that pile of dirt over there. You are not on equal plane with the creator. You are not the center of anything. He is the center of everything. And because he loves you, you have value. But if you try to take him out of the story, you're nothing more than dirt. That, that's kind of what's going on here. So we are made from dirt. And some of you, you're like, I'm glad I came to church today. I'm completely depressed. Um, But lest you give yourself over to nihilism, you got to finish the verse. Verse 7 says um, that uh, the Lord God formed the man from the dust of the ground, so that humbles us, and he breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and the man became a living creature. In other words, while we have humble beginnings, um, God doesn't just form our bodies like he does with the animals and call it a day. 
And and we've said in this series, we're pro-animal here, particularly dogs. We're pro-dog people. If you're not, I'm praying for you. We're working on it here. Um, But we love animals, but animals have been formed from the dirt of the ground. They have a body. They have basic instincts. But humanity is more than that because God breathed the breath of life into Adam's nostrils. And at that point, he became a living being. And this is not just Adam. If you continue to read on in the story of Genesis, God will look at humanity, which is multiplied on the earth, and he will talk about, man, they're doing so much evil. I can't keep giving the breath of life to them, or they're going to destroy this entire place. So this isn't just unique to Adam. This is all of humanity. We are made from the dust of the ground, and as Dallas Willard says, we're made from dirt and divine breath. We are, and, and this is the tension, um, we, we don't want to think too little of ourselves or too highly of ourselves, and so the best way to maybe hold that tension is memorize verse 7, that you and I are made from dirt and divine breath. And so, um, lest we think too little of ourselves, we got to remember we're images of God. He has put something in us that he hasn't put in the rest of creation, that he has um, breathed something of his own life and vitality into us and to the degree that we draw upon that life and breathe that life in, we have the potential to rise above our dirty origins to experience a plane of life and existence that can show the created order what the creator of all things is like. That's the anthropology of the Bible, if you will, Um, And I believe that's the most life-giving way to live because it doesn't make too little or too much of mankind, um, but it comes right down the middle. And it says that you are dirt and divine breath. Don't think too much of yourself, but at the same time, the potential exists to draw on something incredible. And that sets up everything that comes next. So God makes Adam from the dirt and divine breath, and he places him in this garden paradise that we talked about to do what? Some of you are like, this is a trick question. Someone read the text. That was slick. To work it and keep it. Verse 15. Uh, I'll read it again for us. Uh, The Lord God took the man and he put him in the garden of Eden to work it and to keep it. Here's what that means. Um, Work is not a result of the fall. We are still in the happy chapters of the Bible. And here we get it. God's got a job for Adam. Um, Some of you are like, I really can't be a Christian now. You're telling me work is like part of how God made the world? Uh, Let me say this. This is not saying that sin hasn't made work more difficult than it should be. This isn't saying that sin hasn't messed things up. What this is saying is before sin ever entered the picture, God designed you and me to work. He designed us for a purpose. Again, this is really in a lot of ways reflecting on what we saw in Genesis 1 last week. To be God's image bearers means that we rule over the creation. The the tight version of that, the close-up shot, talks about um, our job as we rule over creation is to work and to keep it. Or as a pastor friend of mine translates these verbs, and I think this is really helpful, um, he he translates that uh, to cultivate and guard. Um, And so if that helps you, whatever terminology helps you, uh, Genesis 2 zooms in on the image of God picture, and it says, yes, we have been given incredible purpose by God. So that means that true life is not found by sitting on our couch and having everyone else in the universe serve us, that you've been given gifts and talents um, that God has given you to make an impact on the world. And true life will will be found as you get off the couch and get in the game and play with all he's given you. And and that's the idea of the image of God. Genesis 2 zooms in and talks particularly about two aspects to the type of work that we have been given. Um, We are to cultivate and guard God's good world. Um, Or or as I would uh, say, I was talking to Karen about this last time, like, how do I explain this? Um, And then I came up with a sports analogy. So Karen's like, I don't know what I contributed to this conversation, but she did. Um, This means that we are to play offense and defense. Okay, um, let, let me explain that for those of you that aren't football fans. Um, to cultivate God's good world is a matter of offense. We are to go out and to actively cause things to flourish. We are to go out and make things better. We are to set up um, systems and structures where people can flourish. We are to um, build places where people can, um, like you remember last week, we were in here and aside from a few leaks, we were mostly contained from the rain, like praise his name, good work, whoever built this roof. Um, We are designed to cultivate. We are designed to make things better. But we're not just here to cultivate. We're also here to guard. 
We are here to defend, to keep this place beautiful. If you're a gardener, you know if all you do is plant good things, but you don't pull out the weeds, your garden ain't going to be beautiful for very long. Um, and, and so here, here's what I would say is regardless of your place in life, um, if you are a human, you have been created to cultivate and to guard the goodness of God's good world. You have been placed in your workplace, in your neighborhood, in your family, um, wherever you find yourself, to do those two things, to cultivate and guard the goodness of the world as God has given it to us. So um, let me give you one example that several of you, though not all, can relate to. I can't do any one example that will do it all. So some of you, you like the roofer analogy. Let me give you this one. Um, uh, is, Is a dad... Uh, I am seeking to cultivate uh, my daughter's little souls. Um, I, that is like the job. I, I love being your pastor. I love working here. The job I'm most excited about is going to be their dad. Um, and, uh, you know, like, unlike, you know, I shared last week, our dog won't sit around and think about uh, kind of all the things that make them unique because uh, our dog, uh, the one that's coming, uh, I just claim that one in the name of Jesus, he won't be made in the image of God, but I have been. And so um, I sit around thinking about, okay, what makes my daughters unique? And, and we had a parent-teacher conference this week, and I'm, I'm, I, I can tell I'm asking more questions than our teacher was prepared for. Like, hey, what's, what's unique about our oldest? How can, how can we draw these things out? Because I am seeking to cultivate her. I'm seeking to draw out everything that God's put in her and really just um, try to put as much, um, as much love and care to make that thing grow as I can. Um, And some of you uh, that have older kids that aren't at like the cute five, four, and three age, you'll tell me like, hey, at the end of the day, you can't determine what they'll do in life. I'm preparing myself for that. But I think as a parent, I can do everything I can to plant and to water and to cultivate and pray that God will make that garden grow. So, So I'm there to cultivate. But what dad among you would not guard when she becomes a teenager and boys start coming around? Right? Like, my job, what, what kind of dad would I be if I cultivate, cultivate, cultivate? And I, I want you to know, I'm trying to set just impossibly high standards in my three daughters so that when boys come around, they'll be like, yeah, no, nope. They'll say no for me. I won't have to say it. And so I'm cultivating. I'm trying to create these high standards. I'm like, nobody's good enough for you, sweetie. You know, just setting the bar way up there. Um, but when the boys start to come around, if there's some fool that wants to treat my daughter cheaply, that sees her as an object to be used and not an image bearer to be loved and to serve and cultivate, I promise you I'm going to guard. There's not going to be me that sits on passive and goes, you know what, honey, you do what you want with your life. He does what he wants. You guys have free will. There's going to be none of that. It's going to be, you want her, you're going to have to come through me. Uh, I am going to cultivate these little girls, but I'm also there to guard them. I'm also there to guard them. And the same is true of you wherever you've been placed, in your workplace, in your families, uh, in whatever relationships uh, you have, you've been placed there to cultivate and guard. And I would just encourage you to think about those aspects of what we talked about last week. You have a purpose. Which part of your purpose is the Holy Spirit really highlighting to you right now? Is it that cultivation side to be proactive, to sow into things? Is it the guarding side that there does come a time where you need to step up and say, That's not okay. This is the line we're drawing. We're not going farther in this place. We have been placed here by God to cultivate and to guard his good creation. Which is why, by the way, when you get to Genesis chapter 3, everyone wants to blame Eve. Like, she listened to the serpent. If you read the story carefully, Adam's there. He ain't garden squat. So um, we'll get there. That's Genesis 3. It's, um, it's not pretty for any of us. Guys and gals, we all fail. Jesus is awesome. There's a story of the, wow, there's a story of the Bible in one sentence. If you just come for that. Guys and gals, we all fail. Jesus is awesome. Have a great week. Um, for those of you that want to finish the text, though, um, let me get back on notes here, huh? <laughs> okay, so God gives humanity this incredible responsibility. And and I don't know if you think often enough about what a responsibility is. Like, I'm a control freak over the little tiny things I make that I have a hard time handing off the work that I do and entrusting it to others. God makes the cosmos. He makes the Garden of Eden a place of beauty and order. And then he hands it to Adam and he puts in Adam's hands the responsibility to either make it continue to flourish or to let that beauty fade. I mean, how amazing as God that he would entrust that to us. But that is what it means to be made in God's image. We have been given an incredible responsibility. 
Um, now, he doesn't just give it to us and say, good luck, fellas. Uh, he, he gives that responsibility to Adam, and then he tells Adam how he is to cultivate and guard God's good world, how he can make things continue to flourish. Look at verse 16, and I think this really gets at the heart of the text. It says, And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, You may surely eat of every tree in the garden, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat, for in the day that you eat of it, you shall surely die. So here we come back to these two trees. Now, um, some of you I know are thinking right now, um, gosh, what a dummy our first parents were. Like God gave them every tree in the garden and they couldn't keep their stinking hands off the one. Like what is wrong with them? Like these aren't complex ethics. This is, don't touch that one. It, it's not even don't touch, it's don't eat that one. I've given you a garden paradise. Go everywhere, but don't go there. Um, and so some of you, you're looking down on our first parents, not realizing that you and I do the same every day, but that's a very natural response to this text. Um, others of you, and, and in my experience is we fall into one of two buckets. Some of you blame our first parents, and you're like, seriously, guys? Like, I think my three-year-old could have complied with that one. But then others of you, you blame God. Where you look at this and you're like, why did God put that tree in the garden if it could lead to death? Like if this tree is so gnarly and nasty and can lead to all the evil we see in our world that the Bible calls death, what in the world was God thinking? Um, Some of you haven't had these questions, but now you do. Uh, And so let me just talk about a couple of views of these trees, because these trees, I think, are at the heart of the zoom-in story of Genesis chapter 2. Some people, I I had a seminary professor who is brilliant, whose theology book I own, who I've been helped so much by, including a lot of what I've shared in Genesis. But one of my professors says, this is his view, the tree was bad. The tree was very, very dangerous, and God told Adam not to eat of the tree because it was legitimately dangerous for him. That is one view that's been held throughout the history of the church. Uh, Now, I think that view is problematic because it says in verse 9 that God made all the trees, and it says in chapter 1 that God made all things good. So I don't know where a bad tree came from all of a sudden, but that that is one way to kind of figure out what's going on here. Um, And that one kind of absolves God. Like, well, why did God put the tree there? Well, Who knows how it got there, but maybe somehow it's bad, and maybe God's trying to protect Adam by saying, don't eat of that one. But then again, I want to come and say, why didn't God just like hack the dang thing down if it's so bad? Like, what's going on? So so that leads to a second option, and this is probably the most popular one in the church. Um, The option is, uh, this is a test. That God, um, like a good parent, wants to sit back and see what happens when he takes his hands off. What are his kids going to do? Will his kids um, obey and follow his leadership, or are they going to rebel and go very, very badly? Um, And this is probably, again, maybe the main view that's held in the church today. I think the problem with that is it misses the overall flow of what's going on in Genesis. Um, If this is just a test... um, Why is God testing them at this point? See, this is actually the very first moment that God gives any free choice uh, to his creatures. So far, it's God determines this is good. God determines this is good. God determines this is good. He puts Adam in the garden. He makes him of dirt and divine breath. He says, draw on my life to rule over this place. And here's the first thing I'm going to tell you. Don't eat of that tree. Is the first thing really going to be a test from God? And so you can hold that view. That's been held throughout the history of the church. But again, I think it gets into, um, like, does God not know what they're going to do? Does he not know that they're going to fail this test? And it leads to more questions than it answers. I would submit to you possibly a third view of these two trees. Um, The third view, I would say, is that God created this tree. Um, It wasn't a bad tree. Um, And it wasn't a test. God created this tree to teach Adam and all of his descendants what life is ultimately meant to be. So this tree isn't dangerous. It's not a test. It's something that is positive that's meant to lead you and me into life if we'll only listen. Um, Listen to how Francis Schaeffer puts it. I think this is a lot more eloquent than I could say it. He says this, God has not made a bad tree. He simply made a tree. And there is nothing intrinsic about this tree that is different in any way from the other trees. 
Rather, God has simply confronted the man with the choice. He could just as well have said, don't cross this stream, don't climb this mountain. He is saying, believe me, stand in your place as a creature, not as one who is autonomous. Believe me and love me as a creature to his creator and all will be well. This is the place with which I have made you. And so I would just say this, um, if it's a test, then the idea is once the tree served its purpose, it's gone, but there's nothing in the narrative that suggests that this tree would ultimately be chopped down and removed from the equation. I would submit to you, I think Francis Schaeffer's right, that God made this tree, it's just a tree, but it's really about the command that is saying, um, life will be found as you trust me. And this tree is put here, because in a world of all things that are good, it's not hard to trust God. And so God puts the one thing in the world that could be an opportunity for the humans to exercise trust and relationship. He says, you see that tree? Uh, I'll pick that one right there. Don't eat from that one. This is not meant to restrict our first parents. This is meant to help us draw on the divine life of God and to express relationship and trust in him. And so if you can view it this way, I would say the two trees in the middle of the garden, they ultimately represent two ways to live. Uh, the tree of life means that to eat from this tree and really all the other trees in the garden um, is to depend on God's definition of good and evil. Um, to say, God, I don't need to eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, which if you were here with us one, uh, week one, that good and evil is a merism. That's kind of the nerdy word we learn for two opposites that include totality. The tree of the knowledge of good and evil would be about um, eating from it. You would uh, gain uh, the ability to determine your own ethical system. Everything that's good, everything that's bad. To eat from the tree of life and every other tree in the garden is to say, God, I don't need to eat from that tree because I know you're my creator. I know you love me and I trust you to tell me what's good and evil. Look at how good this world is. Like, I don't think I can improve on this. So I'm going to let you be God and you determine good and evil. So that's the tree of life. To eat from that tree is to um, depend on God's definition of good and evil and to live by it. But to eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil is to redefine evil on our terms. To say, God, I don't trust you to define good and evil. I don't think you're as smart as me. It's to forget the dirt side of our equation. Uh, and, and to think like Satan that we could become God, we could rule this place better than he can. And so I know you said don't eat from the tree, but who are you to tell me what to do? I think I'm a little bit smarter than you. And, and you might hear that and be like, what monsters our first parents were. I'm telling you, you and I do this every single day. Um, the choice that Adam is facing here and the choice that you and I face every day is, will we live our lives based on God's definition of good and evil, or will we seek to redefine good and evil on our own terms? As we seek to fulfill our calling and to bring flourishing, I haven't met anybody that doesn't want to make the world better. I haven't met any psychopaths that actually want to kill everybody. Most people I know want to make the world better. Their ideas for how to do that are just really, really dumb. And so are mine because I am dirt and divine breath. And that means I have potential in me, but I'm 33. Some of you, you might, okay, I don't think anyone here is 105. Someone can correct me after service. You're 105, you're a blip on the cosmos. And so we have ideas of what we think is going to lead to life that ultimately ends up very badly. And that's what these two trees are ultimately about, is will we trust God's definition of good and evil as we seek to cause others to flourish, or will we say, no, thank you, I'm going to define it on my own terms. And so just to lay this on the ground for you, Genesis chapter 2 culminates in the first wedding ceremony. Um, our world's talking a lot about marriage right now. Will we define marriage on our terms or on God's terms? Um, and, and, and that's one that's immediately here in the text, but you want to zoom out to the whole of the Bible? Will we define good and evil on our own terms? Will we define good and evil at work? Do we just want to cheat on this a little bit to, to get to the ends because the ends justify the means? Do we get to def define that on our own terms or does God get to define that? When it comes to how we treat other people, is it um, that there's a special class of people that we think are ignorant and foolish and can speak evil of as long as we're kind to everybody else? Do we get to define good and evil on our own terms or does God get to say, no, everyone's an image bearer? 
We need to treat everyone with dignity. Like, you, you could do this across the board. Take any ethical dilemma in your life right now. Will you define it by God's definition or your own? That is the ultimate question behind the tree. And so I hope that can give you a little empathy for Adam and for Eve, that they weren't any stupider than you and me, but that they faced the same question that you and I face every day. And I hope as you honestly assess your own life, you can have a little compassion for the choice that they made that is certainly the wrong choice, but it is um, utter pride to look at them and say how dumb they are and to not look at our own lives and to see where we have done this. See, the two trees in the center of the garden are meant to lead humanity into life, but by our own choosing, those trees condemn us. That God offered us life. He said, draw on my life and this place will flourish. And we have all said, no, thank you. This is the two trees at the center of the garden. And it's, it's not a small thing. The choices that we make every day to live one way or the other have life and death consequences. And I don't just mean eternity, though that is certainly in view. But it begins now that... Um, by choosing to eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, saying, God, I'm going to redefine this on my own terms, we experience, uh, I mean, you'll see it in the story of Genesis. The second they do that, there's a marriage fight. That's death. And then right after that, one kid kills another. That's physical death. But that's just the ultimate, com- uh, the ultimate culmination of all of the death that our choices make all day long. Because you and I are dirt and divine breath. We are not eternal. And if we live by our own understanding... We are going to think some things are a great idea that end up getting a lot of people really hurt. And so God tells him this, not to hold anything back from him. What God is trying to show Adam is that life is ultimately about learning to trust me, learning to walk in a relationship with me. I've given you an incredible responsibility, and to the degree that you want to carry that out with me and draw my life and my love, you are going to be an agent of life and love in the world. But the moment you... Say, I don't want to draw on your life and love. I want to define this on my own terms. You will be an agent of death in the world to yourself and to everyone around you. And that verse 17 where we end, it's, it's a little bit ominous. Um, it's still the happy chapter of the Bible. Nothing's gone wrong yet, but I would submit to you, verse 17 explains all of the pain that we see in the world. It, see, it explains all of the injustice and all of the evil. That one group of people have said we're more valuable than this group over here. And so this justifies us doing this over here. I mean, every ounce of injustice and evil and chaos in the world, it comes back to what God said. To try to redefine things on your own terms instead of walking with me and letting me teach you and my life and my love flow through you is going to ruin this paradise that I've given you. And God doesn't want that paradise to be ruined. And so he tells Adam, I've given you every tree, eat from any of them. Don't eat from this tree, not because it's dangerous, but because he's trying to teach him to trust me. That the more that you can exercise trust, you will grow in your ability to image and creativity and to show the world what I am like. And, And this is the wonder and responsibility of being human, that animals make choices that sometimes end badly for humans and it ends up on the news because it's so rare. But humans make choices every day that lead to life and to death. We either eat from the tree of life or the tree of the knowledge of good and evil every single day, and it often doesn't make the news. But you know the stories of your friends that are hurting and the pain in their life. And you do see the stories in the news. This is the wonder and the responsibility of being human, that we are more than animals. We have been put here to impact this world, and our impact will either be life-giving and love-giving, or it will be life-taking and death-bringing. And this is, this is how Genesis will ultimately explain all of the evil in the world, that though God created the world very, very good, we're going to see Adam and Eve and really all who follow in their path choose to rule from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And, um, and, and I say that knowing that these are the happy chapters of the Bible. So I want to, I, wanna, I know that's a heavy word, that there are these two trees and two ways to live. 
And I believe that Genesis 2.17 is meant to be ominous. What are they going to do? Moses' original readers, 3,500 years ago, they knew there was sin. They knew there was evil in the world. So what's God angling for here? The paradise has already been lost. Why are you teasing me with this picture of paradise that's gone? And the reason that God teases us with this picture of paradise is because it's not a tease. That this is the good news of the gospel. Um, that God doesn't leave us to the ways that we have chosen death, that God ultimately gets down into the dirt and he becomes human and he enters into our mess. That in the person of Jesus Christ, uh, God uh, cultivates the world. He plays offense. He goes where there's disease and injustice and evil and people being oppressed. And he says, that's not the way it's supposed to be. He shows the world what God is like perfectly. He says, this is not how God has made you to live. This is how God's made you to live. And he tills up the crusty and broken soil of our world and cultivates and brings life. But Jesus doesn't only play offense. And thank God he doesn't only play offense. Because if all we needed was good advice about how to better love God and our neighbor, Adam wouldn't have ate from the wrong tree. But in the story of the Bible... Uh, We're going to see this in a few weeks. We have an enemy who hates God, and he hates us because we're his image bearers. And so um, Satan gets into the garden, and he deceives our first parents into joining his rebellion. We have all followed in his footsteps. And so if Jesus just comes and plays offense, it's kind of a cruel thing to do. It would be a tease to say, look at how great the world you're made for is. Sorry that you've joined the wrong team. But rather than just play offense, Jesus, at the end of his perfect life, goes to the cross, and in the ultimate act of sacrifice, he lays his life down for us. And on the cross, he dies in our place for our sins, to defend, to protect, and to guard all of us from Satan, sin, and death, so that he can say to us, whoever trusts in me, your sin has been paid for. So what can separate you from my love? Nothing. What can separate you from the picture of flourishing I've created you for? Nothing. Anything on the earth? Nope. Anything in heaven? Nope. Anything under the earth? Nothing can separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord, because Jesus has entered into this world to bring us back into the garden. And so the invitation of the gospel in light of these two trees is for all of those who can see that the ways that we have redefined good and evil on our own terms have brought great pain to this world. Anyone that has been grieved by the injustice of this world, the good news of the gospel is that injustice does not get the last word. That in Jesus Christ there is hope, There is healing, there is redemption, there is forgiveness in his name. So that as these trees condemn us and we all realize we're on the side of eating from the wrong tree, in Christ we are put back on the side of the tree of life, which is why the last book of the Bible ends with Jesus having his people eat from the tree of life. These are the bookends of the Bible, that for all who trust in him, our sin is paid for, our great enemy is defeated, and nothing can drag us away from that place. And so here's what it looks like to, um, in between the two books of the Bible, the beginning of all things and the end of all things, here's what it looks like uh, to eat from the tree of life, to trust God's definition of good and evil. What it looks like uh, is to trust that when God says it is finished on the cross of Jesus Christ, he means it. That no matter how you and I are still works in progress and the Holy Spirit might bring in might be bringing to mind areas of our life where we are redefining good and evil on our own terms. To trust God's definition of good and evil ultimately means to trust that when Jesus said it is finished on the cross, he meant it. That even as we are works in progress, we are by the blood of Jesus counted as righteous and good in the sight of the creator of all things. And even as we are a work in progress, he has put his spirit in us to work new creation in us. And he is committed to working out all things in our life to make us more like Jesus, more like the people we were created to be until we show up in glory and we enter the garden paradise once again. And it doesn't matter what you did this week. You can't lose this. You can't swing yourself outside of this. If you are in Christ, you are as safe as you could ever be. You're even safer than Adam because there's no serpent in his garden. He is stronger than Satan, sin, and death. And so what we're going to do in response to this sermon um, 
is we're going to take communion together. And what communion is, is it's a tangible opportunity to eat um, from the tree of life. Um, That eating language is very particular, very important, that um, the first Christians, they not only preached the gospel with their words, but they broke bread and they remembered the broken body and the shed blood of Jesus that has wiped away their sin, even the ones they haven't struggled with yet, and has bought them an eternity where they increasingly get to live into life as God made it to be. And so I want to encourage you, after I pray, um, we are going to uh, sing the gospel and remember what Christ has done for us. And I want to encourage you to take this time to eat from the tree of life to remember that Jesus' body was broken and his blood was shed for all the ways that we have redefined good and evil on our own terms. And that means if you've trusted that gospel, you're a beloved child of God no matter what you've done this week. And that is the hope that can cause us to approach Genesis, not going, why is the paradise lost? But you and I, who celebrate this meal together, we can look at Genesis 2 and say, this is what God wants to remake in me. This is what he wants to lead me into this week. And so we don't have to pretend we're not struggling. We don't have to feel condemned by our struggles, but we come to the table. We lay our struggles down. We thank him for his grace, and we get up afresh to cultivate and guard and pursue the work that by grace he has entrusted to us again. So let me pray for us, and then we're going to do just that. Father, I thank you that you are a good God, that you think up things that we could never think up, and that you are not only extravagant in the goodness of creation, uh, in the responsibility that you've given to us, but that you are extravagant in your grace. Um, That for all the ways that we fall short and that we have um, destroyed the good world you have made, rather than leave us in death, you've come to redeem us and bring us life. And so I pray for every person in this room where the stench of death just reigns over our life. I pray that by the power of your Holy Spirit, you would break through, that we would see that um, no sin has more power than the cross of Jesus Christ. And no one in this room this morning has to experience anything other than life because of what Jesus has done. So would you um, give us uh, eyes to see the gospel, um, to run to Christ this morning, and to celebrate that though we might be disappointed with the choices we've made or the choices other people have made in our life, um, nothing's bigger than the cross of Jesus. And that that is what gets its final word over us. So would you help us Um, to come and eat from this meal you have given us um, and lead us into life. In the beautiful name of Jesus, I ask. Amen.